had a family member or a friend had actually had a heart attack? Anybody? Oh, tell me about that. Who did? My grandma. Your grandma. How old was she when she had that? Like 40 something. I wasn't born. Okay, so she was younger when she had that. Now, so heart attack means that the area of the heart, there was a blocked artery where the artery, there was no flow. So you have a muscle now that's getting no flow, no oxygen, no blood. And that part of the heart muscle dies. And therefore, the rest of the heart has to try to take over the best that it can. And in some cases, it can take over pretty well, and in some cases, it can't take over well enough. And when it can't take care of them well enough, that patient develops what's called heart failure, meaning that there is that the body has certain demands, but the heart can't meet those demands. And so people are chronically short of breath, weak, fatigued, heart rhythm problems, can't do as much as they used to do. Totally changes the course of their life. So my focus as a heart specialist is, of course, to take care of people who are having trouble. But my real focus and what really gets me excited every day when I get up is how can I prevent people from getting this in the first place? And we're going to talk today about prevention because, you know, uh, it's always been said, it's actually been said in, in Chinese medicine for many, for thousands of years, that good doctors take care of people who are having problems, but the best doctors prevent the problems from happening in the first place. So our objective is to teach you how to be good doctors and best doctors, okay? So what I want to do is I want to move on now. Um, uh-oh, we better just think about this a second. You saw these arteries. Now we've got some, any, anybody in this room going to be a surgeon? Okay, well, here's what you're going to do. You're going to cut. And we're going to make a cut right in this artery. And now let's see what happens. What's it look like? It looks like a tube. Okay, so it's just like it had a garden hose and it took that scalpel out. And now you've got something that looks like a tube. So what's the deal with this? What's in this tube? Well, there are different kinds of cells or particles in that tube that are important in the body's function. For example, these white cells here, their major job is to fight infection. And if you don't have those, you're cooked. Because any bacteria that comes along, any germ that comes along, you can't fight it, you're dead. White blood cells are critical. Well, I don't know how to yeah. Yes? So the people who have a weak immune system, like everybody coughs in their face, they get a cold, does that mean they have like, not a lot of white blood cells? Well, they may not have enough white blood cells. They may not have, um, the white blood cells they have may not work very well. Or there may be other things that promote um, uh, their being sick aside from white blood cells. The white blood cells, uh, too, little, too few of them or bad function of them can contribute to that. Red blood cells, their main job is to carry oxygen. Yes, you have a question. Um, can't you improve your immune system? Sure you can improve your immune system. The way you improve your immune system is by taking good care of yourself. So number one, sleep, believe it or not. Sleeping at least eight hours a night, you might say, oh, come on, nobody's sleeping. The answer is if you sleep eight hours a night, your immune function markedly improves. If you eat the right kinds of foods rather than junk food all the time, you improve your immune function. If you exercise, you improve your immune function versus not improving your immune function. Um, you know, so all of those things improve your body's ability to fight off infection, prevent you from getting sick. The better you do with that, the better off you are. But that's a great question. Red blood cells, their main job is to carry oxygen to the tissues. You've got to get oxygen to those tissues or those tissues die. And then these yellows are called lipoprotein particles. Lipoprotein meaning lipid, which is fat, and protein, which is protein. You cannot just let fat float in your circulation. It has to be carried by a by a protein together. It's lipoproteins. Why? Have you ever seen what happens when you have water and you pour fat on top of it? What happens? The fat sits on the, on the surface. It doesn't dissolve in the water. If we didn't have these dissolving in our blood, and our blood, remember, is water-based, we'd be cooked. So you got to have lipoproteins. What do they do? They carry the fats 
the cholesterol primarily. And we know cholesterol is something we think of, oh, that's something that's bad. In fact, cholesterol is good. Why? Because it helps these, cholesterol, these lipoprotein particles actually provide fuel for the body cells to work. They make the membrane, the outer lines of cells. If you didn't have cholesterol, you'd have all your cells would fall apart. It makes salt and water balance. It helps have just the right amount of salt and the right amount of water in your system. It makes vitamins. And nothing you all would be interested in is sex hormones, but you know, it's also important. So the, the key thing to remember is all of those things are based on those lipoprotein particles. And in order for you to have normal body function, you've got to carry those to the right places in the body. And it's only when these are present in excess amounts that you're in trouble. And we'll talk about that in just a second. So, how does this process of someone needing the angioplasty or the bypass or the stents, how does that all happen? Well, if your blood pressure is too high, the pressure beats on the walls of the arteries, damages that wall, damages this nice thin lining and those lipoprotein particles get caught in the wall. If you smoke cigarettes, you damage the linings of the arteries. These particles get caught in the wall. There are states, there are certain people with severe types of arthritis or other immune problems where you also have a damaged lining of the artery, irritating the artery lining. But damage is the key, so here's what happens. Huh? You see that? Here's what happens. Watch. Blood flows down, and now, with that damaged lining, those particles can get into the artery wall. And that can cause a problem. Yes? So, the cigarette smoke causes a problem for the arteries because yeah. it goes through the lung, right? Because, well, it does impair lung function, it hampers lung function, but it also directly damages the linings of the arteries. Every puff of a cigarette damages the linings of the arteries directly. Every single puff damages those linings. So it's a big, big problem. And the more a person does it, the worse it is. But now what I'm going to tell you is something that a lot of you don't know about. We're going to talk about how a heart attack gets ready to happen. Because what most of us remember is, we took that artery and you cut that artery open. I remember you cut that artery open and you got this, right? All right, now, there was some, this person had high blood pressure, was a smoker, and had some ir other irritation of the artery. And pretty soon some of those particles got caught in the wall. And then pretty soon a lot more of those particles got caught in the wall. Now, would any of you want to make a guess right now about whether this person, remember we've made a cut in his artery and, and this is the channel the blood passes through, is this person likely to have any symptoms of chest pain because they're not getting enough blood flow? The answer is no, absolutely not. Why? Because the artery is still open the same amount. What's happened? This artery has started to stretch outward. It's got to be more of a kind of an oblong rather than a circle. And that's a key concept here. Because you know how most people think heart attacks happen? Most people think heart attacks happen like this. You've had some high blood pressure, you go out to McDonald's and you're gonna to start to get a you know, double bacon, triple, oh. quadruple cheese, whatever it is. <laughs> you start to eat more and more of those. And then you feel that what's happening is you start to cake up this artery. And then you go out and you do it again and you cake it up more. And then you get Kentucky Fried Chicken and you cake it up more. And you go to Dunkin' Donuts and you plunk it off. I'm ready for the big one, okay? <laughs> That's not at all the way a heart attack happens. It. it does not happen that way. <coughs> Have any of you heard of a story of a, of a person who went to their doctor and had a checkup and everything was fine and they even did an electrocardiogram, the electrical activity of the heart, and that was fine. And they did a stress test, put them on the treadmill and watched their heart, and that was fine. And then two weeks later, they got a heart attack. Yeah. Ever, anybody heard of that? You might say, well, gee, that must be a bad doctor. No, that's not at all a bad doctor. Here's what happens. Here's why that happens. Because a heart attack occurs like this. You get that, that big 
fatty deposit in the wall of your artery, and then there's a crack. It cracks, the artery cracks, and pretty soon a blood clot forms that blocks off the artery. The artery wall cracks. It's not that you keep piling it up and piling it up and piling it up and then plunk it off. It's the artery wall that cracks, and most heart attacks occur in the absence of a major blockage in an artery. Now some people have this process so bad that the artery can't stretch anymore. Now these, this fat kind of extends into the artery wall to gradually reduce the flow so they get chest pain on exertion. But actually most heart attacks occur because the artery wall cracks right there, causing a blood clot to block off the artery. And that's the way that that person who went to their doctor and had a checkup and everything seemed great, ended up having a heart attack. So you might say, geez, well, if this is the case, how are we ever going to know whether a person's at risk for a heart attack? And if, in, if we know if they're at risk, can we do something about it? The answer is, just wait, because I'm going to show you how we can do that. It's really exciting. And again, remember, what does the best doctor do? Prevents disease, OK? OK. Yes, you have a question? Now, um, you said like people go to Burger King for McDonald's and stuff, right. and it keep building up. So like, if somebody eats fast food every day, besides exercise, what else? How can you prevent the fat from building up? On your well, the answer is, so the question is, if somebody eats fast food every day and doesn't really exercise, how, how can you prevent the fat from building up? And we'll talk about this a little bit, but the answer is, I think that equipping you with, with knowledge is the first step of this. The answer is, it doesn't mean you can't ever go to fast food. It just means if you go to fast food, you make better choices. You get grilled chicken instead of getting a, a double bacon cheeseburger. You, you make better choices if you go to fast food less often. You try to exercise more regularly. I'm not looking for perfect. I'm just looking to inform you, to make you know. The more you know, the better equipped you are to make good decisions. And I want all of you to be equipped to make great decisions as you move forward. I don't want you or anybody in your family having this. Now, I'm prepared to take care of this when it happens, but I don't want to take care of that. I want to keep, I want to keep the process such that it never gives anybody a problem. Okay. So, what are the factors that increase the risk for heart attack? Well, some people just have a thousand family members who've had heart attacks at a young age, and they carry certain genes that promote the risk. And you know what? Even then, we can protect people. We have some people who have extraordinarily high cholesterol levels. They were born with it. They have problems with the way that cholesterol is processed in the body. And they have tons of cholesterol in their body. And we give those people medicine. In many cases, we can get the cholesterol levels down. And in some people, we can't get it down even enough with the medicine. And then we do a process called LDL apheresis which is where we hook up a person's two veins, we, take, we run the blood through a machine that's, that sucks out 80% of the cholesterol in the body, and then we return the clean blood to the patient. Those are the most extreme cases, but there's almost, there's almost nothing we can't do to help our patients. We have so many ways we can help patients, but you know what? I'd rather keep people out of trouble than have to, than have to go to those meetings, but we do sometimes. So getting older, there's a higher risk over time. Not in all cultures, though. Some of the, especially in, um, uh, especially in some of the Asian cultures, there's not much higher risk. There's somewhat higher risk, but not dramatically higher risk as you get older. High fats in the blood we talked about. The more fat there is, the greater the chances for those fats to get into the walls of the arteries. High blood pressure. Anybody ever had their blood pressure measured in this room? Yeah. Good. Now, that's great. Cuff goes on your arm, someone pumps up the cuff, listens with a stethoscope over the artery, and there are two numbers that are recorded, the higher number and the lower number. Both of those numbers are important in terms of the work that the heart has to do and the resistance against which the heart has to pump. When those numbers are too high, especially 140 over 90, we know that that reflects high blood pressure and a greater chance for artery wall damage. So blood pressure measurement is important. And then smoking damages the lines of the arteries directly, increasing your risk for heart attack. Okay, now, so what are things we can do that can reduce the risk? Well, number one, number one, 